Okay, good morning everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So this presentation, the philosophy of it is think globally, drink locally. <laughs> so it's all about, basically my competition is all the front range wineries, a few of them, we're not going to go through all of them, um, in Colorado. You'd probably be surprised to know that there's over a hundred wineries in the front range of all of this state. Um, Boulder currently has five, and they all make wine in a very different style, very different manner. It's kind of hard to get bored. You're definitely going to find something you like from one of these local wineries. Um, the majority of these wineries, they get all the grapes from the Grand Valley. Um, the Grand Valley and the West Elks ABA produce 90% of the grapes that are used for wine um, in the state. So um, one of the local ones that I like a lot, it's been around since 2003, is Boulder Creek Winery there in Gun Barrel. Most of these wineries, their tasting rooms are open on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday. A few of them are open on Fridays, and they're all, they've all got websites. Um, one uh, really good source for local wine information is coloradowine.com. They have a very interactive website. It shows you maps, shows you locations, hours, what they make. Um, Again, they, um, they source all of their grapes from the Western Slope and make a lot of different styles of wine. I just like, uh, they just had a label redo, um, and I just, I think they're one of the better winemakers in the state. Uh, Ballesteri has been around quite a long time. Um, John Ballesteri used to be a cut flower grower. He had a lot of greenhouses, and when NAFTA took effect, he was getting clobbered price-wise. He'd always made wine in the basement. Uh, that's kind of a common theme with especially all the people that, uh, have, that are of Italian descent. They've all got stories of making wine with their dad and their grandfather in the basement. So he has, uh, they have a huge event center in Commerce City. And it's a beautiful facility and it has a blue ribbon view of the Cherokee power plant. <laughs> just, you just, you're, you're, they have one of the hugest tasting wine bars um, in the state. I mean, it's really nice. And you walk out back to, to the grounds where they have events, and there's the power plant. Can right you there. taste the terroir? Oh, thankfully no. Plant. Thankfully no, because he gets all his grapes from the Western Slope also. But he started out, uh, you know, 22 barrels, um, and started out at the farmer's markets. 2012, he had over 270 barrels of wine in his cellar, which equates to about 6,000 cases of wine. He sells most of his wine right there hmm. yeah, at, at their taste room. They have, they have a few liquor stores that, that carry their products, but basically it's John, his wife, their daughters, and their grandkids hmm. are all made in the, the tasting room. And they don't charge for tasting room. You're gonna, they have like, We'll go through 12, 14 different wines. Wow. One thing that's interesting about Ballesteri is he's um, a natural winemaker. He doesn't add anything to the wine. He doesn't add any sulfites. It all occurs naturally. Yeah. So there's a bit of a gambit. He never enters his white wines in a competition because the color's always off, because he doesn't stop the fermentation process you know, when, you know, to get the right color. So he just enters his red wines in competitions. Am I allowed to ask a question? You bet. That, that would be organic then, right? Or well, yeah, but the grapes are certified organic. Uh, okay. But the way he makes the wine, he doesn't add anything to it. Right. You know, he just lets the wine do his thing. No hangover. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it helps with that. Yeah. So the opposite end of the spectrum is this little little place called Riker's Cellar. It's one guy, a forklift, a bat, and like 20 barrels, um, 30 wine barrels. He, um, he learned how to make wine in Napa. He gets all of his grapes from Napa because that's where all of his connections are. And he, um, he it's just a day's difference time walk. He goes, my, my California truck, you know, takes his a day away from all the trucks in, in the Grand Valley. Um, and a really nice wine, but 750 cases, that's all he makes. And when you go to the tasting room, if you have more than two or three people, it's kind of overwhelmed. <laughs> it's, it's just him. Next door is uh, Bonacista. They, they're in this little warehouse area. Um, next door to him is Bonacista Winery. Paul was a former radio DJ. And he now has a sommelier uh, certificate. 
and he, uh, typical immigrant experience, learned how to make wine with Grandpa and Dad. And he is a very uh, blue collar in his attitude about wine. He, um, you can you can go there and buy a growler of wine and just fill it out, <laughs> fill it directly from the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it? Sorry. These, it, it's uh, 47th and Pecos. It's in our house district. There used to be an old Keebler cookie factory in our neighborhood, yep. and he's just to the south of that. Hmm. And again, small production, about 1,000 cases a year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Book Cliff Vineyards is up here in Boulder. They got, they got started in Boulder in their backyard and basement. Um, grew grapes in, the, in their backyard. At baseline in 22nd. Um, they opened up the winery in 99. Again, sort of their, their, their production now is along the same as Ballast Ferry. And they're, they're, they have a lot of shelf space in a lot of different liquor stores. But again, you know, Book Cliff, now they, it, what's odd is you, they don't have a tasting room in the Grand Valley. That's where the vineyard is. But they don't entertain there. Um, their tasting room is here in Boulder. And this is on North Broad, North uh, 36 by Gateway. September is, a, is the newest winery. They're next door to Bookcliff. Um, again, grapes from, uh, from Colorado. They, uh, very small production, 500 cases. They've only um, they've had seven vintages so far. Um, very Italian style of winemaking. Um, very much uh, food centric. I was there Sunday at their place, and they had a uh, wine that was. Is was that a September or what we love? You're thinking of the mold spice wine, aren't you? I am. Yeah. I was really bizarre. Yeah. It, and it was like, it's different. And, and that's that's a what we love winery, which is next door to September and book left. There's three of them right next to each other. Oh, okay. But it was very surprising to have a hot wine. Yeah. Was, yeah. And they said it will sell for during the winter. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't like I'm real traditional. If, if the beer doesn't taste like beer, I don't like it. If the wine doesn't taste like wine, I don't, I don't like all the other stuff added to it. And that's, that's uh, across from Gateway? Yep. September, Book Cliff, and um, What We Love Winery are all pretty much across the street from Gateway. And, and Upslope Microbrewery. And Upslope Microbrewery is also they right have time. time. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Des designated drivers sure here. Well. <laughs> For dessert. <laughs> yeah, I just stumbled over to my place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> With what? So, you can walk to those places on occasion. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's what I did on Sunday. I walked walk there and crawl back. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been growing grapes in Colorado for a long time. 1899. Um, um, Governor George Crawford planted some of the first grapes in, uh, in Palisade. And no, not a few people know this, the whole peach and fruit industry in Palisade and the Grand Valley area took place after Pro when Prohibition went into effect and ripped out all of the grape stock. And they started planting fruit because they couldn't sell the grapes anymore. And now it's going swinging back the other way where there's more and more vineyard acreage. Do, what do you think that is? Do you think the weather changing has anything to do with it? Or? Well, everyone's talking about it and everyone's, you know, it's kind of like the ski areas. They're just all get an eye on where they may need to buy land next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of that is pest driven and uh, most, you know, a lot of these vineyards, you know, they're, they're irrigated, so if they have water rights for a while, they have, to, they have to depend on where they fall. I think that's you in that picture, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> so again, 90% uh, 90, um, well, 90 of the grapes um, grown in Colorado come from the West Elks and the Grand Valley ABA. And we have the highest, some of the highest uh, vineyards in the world, and that's in uh, Hotchkiss and Peony. Terra Creek has got the highest altitude. Do they compare to a um, uh, California product? Um, they're starting to. Uh, an interesting comment, the last time I was out in wine country was, um, we've all, everyone is talking about Colorado, we've all stopped apologizing for our wine. We all, we all have figured out the best grapes to use. We've all figured out our skill sets as far as what we do right and what we do wrong. 
and now you know, and, and it's getting more and more complex, and, and there's a, really a lot of good wine. It's, you know, it's kind of hard to get, talk me into flying out to California to drink wine that I can drink here. What are the best types of grapes to be grown in Colorado? Well, there's um, we got I had some percentages. The 2010 harvest, which is the last time there were numbers supplied, um, Riesling was the biggest grape being grown. And it's gaining in popularity mainly because people figured out it doesn't have to be sweet. It doesn't? There are a lot of nice dry, crisp Rieslings, and there's some off dry Rieslings. So that's gaining ground. Cabernet Sauvignon is still the big one. And Syrah, Merlot, a lot of them. Petit Verdot, there's a whole lot of variables. That, there's a whole bunch of 1 and 2 percent grape crop. There's also some uh, Pinot. Yeah. Pinot, and that's in the, um, the West Elks. Yeah, that's the only place it grows. Yeah. Can, can you generalize what the grapes are like in Colorado as opposed to California? Like, is there, are they less sweet? Or are they? It all, it all, you know, that's the vineyard specific and wine grower specific. Um, they, the, the, in spite of the uh, altitude, is that we have the same growing conditions as California and Washington State. Hmm. About the soil, the soil is. It's rich. So we're at 11 minutes here. Okay. I'll let you just go ahead and finish up your presentation. And we'll take all right. So uh, economic impact in this state. Um, the, product, we've, the wine industry has grown 70 percent over the last five years, and more than a tenfold increase since they kept numbers back in 1991 and 92. Um, there was, uh, let's see what. In, in 2013 and 14, there was $24 million worth of wine produced from a, a retail value. And in addition to that, another $20 million was put in the economy by wine tourism. That's the money spent besides buying wine because they came out here to buy wine. So it's a, it's a big economic engine. Uh, a couple things to remember. Colorado Mountain Wine Festival in Palisade, 918 through 921. That's when everyone is pressing grapes and it's a big festival. That would be a great time to visit wine country. And then Denver International Wine Festival, not so much a local thing, but it's in the other big wine event in Denver is in November. And um, all this information was from my visits to some of these wineries and coloradowine.com. That's like the easy place to go for any information on any of this. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.